and thanks for the tip on the button. So um, welcome to my presentation uh, session, how to, or actually just uh, land your dream Drupal job guaranteed. And my name is Samson Love. I work for Cost Resource. Some of you may have seen me at other Drupal meetups. We happen to be hiring, but as promised, this is not a come work for our company, we're really great talk, even though we are, I think, a pretty great company to work for. We're nice people. Um, but I am actually here to share with you some of my experiences uh, over the last uh, 13 years of running my own business and the last uh, most recent year of working for a company as a CTO um, in charge also of hiring everyone on our team uh, on the technical side. So I've uh, read over 400, actually approaching 500 resumes in the last year from applicants as well as referrals and uh, other people that we were considering interviewing. I've interviewed um, a lot of people on the phone as well as in person. And uh, I've hired 14 people uh, to work for our team. So um, when we get to the end of this little talk about um, landing your dream Drupal job, um, and how you can guarantee yourself the ability to do that um, immediately. Um, if you have any questions about the hiring process or tools or um, in general ideas from uh, a company's point of view that you feel that I missed, please ask them. Speak really loud so the people who are listening to this later will be able to uh, hear your questions and I'll answer them as best as I can. And um, with that, let's get started. So um, today I'm going to go over uh, a couple things. First, we're going to talk about preparation. We'll talk about the interview process itself that uh, a lot of you or your team will go through in, in trying to land these positions, whether they're uh, part-time or, or permanent. Um, the evaluation of the interview process uh, is extremely important, and uh, I'll go over that in some detail. And I'll wrap up by covering some of the most common mistakes that I have seen, uh, as well as some that um, some of you have probably made and just not, not realized it, not thought that it was something as important as it actually is to a hiring company or even to a hiring individual looking to hire a developer for just uh, one project. And I'll mention some things you'll want to remember. <coughs> and I will also uh, recommend some uh, resources that you guys should be able to use for career advancement. So before we get uh, on and full steam ahead, how about if everybody cleared their throat really well one time? So uh, <coughs> thank you. All right. All right. So now the folks at home can, can listen, hopefully, without too many interruptions. Um, and as I mentioned, when we're finished, I'll, uh, I'll entertain any questions that you guys have about, uh, about this session or about anything else you think I, I might have an answer to. So the first thing you want to do to get your dream Drupal job is to prepare. And when I say prepare, what I mean is take an inventory of yourself um, and be realistic, be honest, you just might learn something. Uh, who am I is, is the question that you're going to be answering in, in all of these. Not who do I want to be or what do I think I can do at some point, but who am I today, right now? Um, and the relevant questions that you'll want to ask uh, in terms of the who am I uh, uh, broad topic um, to enable yourself to get that dream job, whatever that job is, uh, are questions about your uh, experience. What is my experience? Uh, what kind of person am I? Um, these are very open-ended, broad questions, but taking an inventory, and I recommend writing these things down on, a, on an actual notepad, not doing it with a computer. We use computers all day long. Tr try doing it with a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper. You, it will activate a different part of your brain, and you'll come up with different answers than 
you might otherwise come up with. And as I said, you, you might learn something. Um, what kind of worker am I? And when you answer these questions, these can be mind maps where you're outlining stuff and scribbling arrows, pointing to other things and jotting down notes or drawing pictures. Um, you, you will definitely find this a rewarding experience if you take it seriously and, and give it the time that it deserves. I'm not talking about an assignment or a little project you're going to do. I'm talking about something that has the potential to affect literally the rest of your life. So take it seriously, because if you follow these steps, I can guarantee you, and you know where to find me if I'm wrong, I guarantee you, you can significantly impact your life if you just pay a little bit of attention to um, following some of these guidelines. And of course, this isn't a rigid structure, it's suggestions. You can add your own um, notes or comments or things that you think that I forgot. And um, on that topic, uh, I'm on uh, GDO and LinkedIn, uh, Samson Love, S-A-M-S-O-N-L-O-V. If you think I missed something, uh, look me up, contact with me, or co connect with me, send me an email. Um, you can find me on some of the forums, uh, LAPHP. Um, and LA Drupal. Uh, what can I give? So well, what can I give to the company that I'm applying for? Or what can I give to the clients that I want to have uh, retain me? Uh, and that's not what can I give someday when I learn some other skill. Again, it's what can I give now? What is my skill set now? Uh, what can I do? So am I... Um, able to work in a certain capacity? Am I able to bring a certain kind of technical knowledge to the table? I'll cover that in a little bit more detail. What do I bring to the table? Um, that's sort of a, a question that interviewers will like to ask. You know, well, what, do you, what do you feel you bring uh, to the company? So what do I bring to the table is really the answer to that, that question. That, that's what they want to know. It's, it's very open-ended and it's what do you think are your strengths and what do you think are the areas where you add value. Um, and if you can write down uh, add value or remember the phrase add value or how do I add value, just remember that question. If you're able to effectively answer that question in an interview, that will be one of the most significant questions that you will be able to answer, especially if you can answer it before they ask. Um, most interviewers who have been interviewing for a while will give you time to ask questions and make comments before the interview is over. Um, and uh, if they haven't asked you how you can add value, you want to make sure you tell them. Uh, and then I put this at the end, not because it's at the end of the list, but because it's the most important component of this entire process of finding a job, finding a, a position with a company, or uh, finding clients. And the question is, what do I need? Now, too often developers don't ask that question. They think, well, what does the company need and how can I figure out how to do it? What do I need is equally, if not more important than what a company needs. Because if you ask the question and answer it, what do I need? You will be self-selecting to be matched with employers or future uh, clients that are a good fit for you. And working with clients who are a good fit is probably the most significant thing you can do to not only improve your chances of success in business, but also to improve your personal life and the time when you're not working. Um, it'll help your health. You won't have as much stress. Um, and you'll just get a general feeling of um, more personal satisfaction um, from working in an environment where you feel like you are appreciated because getting what we need is one of the ways that we're able to feel appreciated. So what do I need is, is really important. So... Uh, the previous slide, um, there are three questions. Um, what do I need? Um, what kind of a person am I? What kind of a worker am I? So these are the questions. Um, can you give some yes. answers, like example answers? Yes, I can give some example answers. So. Uh, what kind of a person am I? So you might say, for example, um, well, here's what I would say. That, and this is just me. This isn't what you should put in your resume unless this happens to also apply to you, some of these. So I would say I am an extremely hard worker. I 
get tremendous personal satisfaction out of completing a task to the best of my ability. And that's probably true for uh, most, if not all of you here. That's why you're coming to these kind of camps and sessions. You want to uh, better yourselves. Um, it's not easy to get up uh, early in the morning and drive 50 or more miles to come listen to someone talk about, you know, views or CCK or how to get a job. It's, you know, it's Sunday. <laughs> But you guys are all are all committed to to your careers, and that's that's part of why you're here. So, when I say I'm an extremely hard worker, I'm an extremely hard worker because I actually enjoy working, um, and I've always enjoyed working. So that's a strength that I have, and that's the kind of uh, worker that I am. The kind of person I am, I've been described as a happy-go-lucky kind of person by colleagues and family. Um, I get up in the morning with a smile. Uh, I'll, you know, dance around the house. Uh, I'll try not to sing in the shower because I don't want to scare anybody, but I've been known to do that. I'm just a generally positive person. Some people are more plotting or more um, reserved in their nature. There is no right or wrong way to be, but if you can answer the question of what kind of person am I in a very global sense or personal sense, and you're able to be honest about that, that will help you when you're developing relationships with clients because you will match yourself with clients having the awareness of who you are and how you interact and how you perceive the world. So that's what, what kind of a person am I? Your work ethic um, the kind of hours you like to work, I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail. That's what kind of worker am I? Um, and I'll, I'll come up with, I'll, I'll, I'll mention some more examples in a, in a later slide. And then what do I need? Um, thank you for asking me to expand on that because what do I need does not mean how much money do I need to make. That has how much money you need to make should have nothing to do with the kind of job you take or the kind of person you work for. It should be mutually exclusive. You should be able to find a really good fit position at whatever your salary requirements are if your salary requirements are realistic. If you need to make a million dollars a week as a software developer, good luck. But if you need to make a living to be able to support a family in the city where you live, which happens to be the city where you work, if you are good at what you do, and I'll go into some more details, but if, for example, you're a conscientious, hardworking, dedicated, resourceful, uh, qualified, and competent uh, worker, coder, developer, designer, um, system administrator, you will be able to support a family with you know, sometimes with the help of another income, that's just the reality of, you know, the 21st century. We, most of us have families with two incomes. Um, but what do I need is not just how much money you need to make. It's all of the tangible and intangible qualifications of the experience you would like to uh, be involved in when you are not at home. So when you're, when you're working... And when you're at your job, not to say that when you're not at home, you're always working, but when you are working, what kind of environment do I want to be in? Do I want to be, in, do I need a really high energy environment? Do I need a ton of praise? Do I need music loud? Do I need a quiet environment? Do I need to be surrounded by a whole bunch of other people doing the same tasks that I'm doing? Or do I need to work in an office or in a cubicle by myself with my headphones on with my choice of music. Those, those are all the kind of questions you want to ask when you say, what do I need? If you don't ask those questions, no matter what the salary the company pays you or how exciting their project is or how otherwise um, attractive the company might seem, you probably won't truly be happy at your work. And it's been my experience that people that are happy at their work tend to do better work and they tend to excel at their jobs more so than people who are less happy at their work, whether they're less happy because of their personality and just their nature or because they're less happy because the position just isn't a good fit for them. So I'm going to move on. Um, when you talk about experience, there's two types of experience that 
all web developers should both list on their resume as well as talk about in an interview. And the non-web experience or things that don't have to do with coding or building machines or IT or um, you know, taking uh, 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 classes or getting a degree in computer science, whether it's a master's or a bachelor's degree, that's all web experience. Non-web experience would be, what industries have I worked in? I worked at Wendy's when I was 15 years old. That was one of my first, quote-unquote, real jobs. What did I learn? Well, I learned that I don't want to work in a minimum wage uh, <laughs> environment um, being lectured by somebody who I thought was you know, maybe not that qualified to do their job, which was just to tell me how to flip the burgers. Um, so that was my last fast food job. But uh, <laughs> got to start somewhere. But I've also, uh, I've worked in construction. And what I, what I learned working in construction was that sometimes you have a boss who you might think is not as smart as you or not as qualified as you to do things in a certain way, but on a construction crew, it runs very much like a sports team. Every person has their job, and there is a captain or a quarterback or uh, a coach who runs it, and you might not agree with that person, but if you want to be on that team, you have to do your job in the way that you're – the reason you were brought in there. You know, If you're a kicker, you're not going to all of a sudden say, oh, well, I'm a linebacker today. And um, I don't know if that was a good analogy because I don't follow the NHL. So, you know, just uh, <laughs> forgive me on the, on the sports thing. Um, but the question you, you should use the, the, to tie in your non-web experience to your web experience is how did these experiences make me a better web developer? Or how did these experiences make me a better designer? And chances are most of you have had work in some capacity not directly related or directly connected to the, the kind of work that you are looking for or that you are doing now. And if you can make the connections between your previous employment and the employment that you're seeking or the employment that you're doing now, it will either improve your prospects of landing that uh, new position or role or relationship. And if you're already working, it will help you find new ways to look at your job or your role. Um, so something to consider, non-web experience. Now, for web experience, again, be realistic and be honest. Um, you know, uh, there's a tendency sometimes to sort of talk up your uh, your achievements or one's achievements and to say, oh, well, you know, I've, I've done all this and I've worked on these amazing sites and, you know, I worked on the site for this really large company and I, you know, I helped develop this thing. Take an honest, assess an honest assessment of what your role really was in, in conducting your your day to day duties and what your real responsibilities were, because if you do that, um, you will have a better chance of positioning yourself uh, again, for that dream position. Again, the dream job, the requirement to get your dream job is that it has to be a job you're qualified for. Now, if your dream job is a job that you're not yet qualified for, maybe you can adjust your short-term goals to land a job that will help prepare you for your dream job. And there is no shortage of those kind of jobs out there. There are tons of companies that will pay great money give excellent benefits, provide a work environment and an opportunity to train you and teach you to become substantially more advanced, better and more experienced than you are now um, and lead you to that position because those companies would rather promote someone from within their organization most times than bring in new talent. It's so, so much better to bring someone in and groom them into the position that the company needs. And the company at that point has made a substantial investment in that employee. And it's in both 
the uh, employee's interest to do their best job, obviously, for the company to maybe earn some kind of promotion or advancement or get to that next step. But it's in the company's interest to treat them well because they may have invested $100,000 training that person or more. So uh, be honest with yourself about the kind of work that you've done when you're, when you're on this road to getting the new position. Another question you want to uh, ask yourself is, how comfortable am I with the command line? And the reason I put that in as, as something important is because a lot of companies expect people today, whether they're in the design end of the, the department or if they're in the development end of the department or if they're in the IT end of the department, they want people who understand computers at a quote-unquote computer level. So... If you understand your way around um, the command line and you can use a lot of these shortcuts and um, faster tools to create, manipulate, organize, or extract uh, the data or objects that you need to work with on a day-to-day -day basis, it makes you more valuable to a company that understands the power of these kinds of tools. If you are not comfortable with the command line, a piece of advice is become comfortable with the command line. It's actually not that hard. It really isn't. Just think a DOS prompt. You know, D-I-R, enter. Oh, I just listed a directory. CD, dot, dot. Oh, I just went back one level. It, it's pretty easy stuff. There are some very esoteric and... and um, fancy and tricky things that you can do in the command line but that's really where all this stuff started um, and it will uh, open your eyes if you're not uh, already there it, once you start looking at, at some of the speed and uh, benefit of the command line and I'll talk about Drush in a minute. When you're talking about your web experience you want to ask yourself uh, am I a generalist, a specialist, or a little of both? Am I, uh, am I a developer? Am I a designer? Am I, a, am I an IT person? Do I kind of know a little bit about all these things? A little bit of both. Am I a specialist? Am I a really, really solid, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm an 8.5 or 9 with PHP, and I'm a 10 with Photoshop and Dreamweaver, and I have a degree in graphic design. So maybe that's a lot of both. But you have to be able to answer that question if you're looking to work with someone who wants to hire a developer to be the developer. It's a little different when you're getting a, a position in a department where you're just going to be focusing on one skill set, but if you are uh, a generalist, that is an asset to the right company. If you're a specialist, that is an asset to the right company. And if you're both, that too is an asset for the right employer or the, or the right uh, contract client. And you have to be able to identify with certainty where you fit across that spectrum or how much of a generalist you are and how much of a specialist you are and be able to provide concrete examples. That's very important. Now, front end versus back end, that line uh, is very faint to me to the extent that there even is a line anymore. Um, I know a lot of developers will say, oh, I'm, I'm a back-end developer. I don't do any of that uh, CSS stuff, and I don't do any of that styling. And I think that's a mistake because the reality is, is modern websites and newer technologies, and I'm not going to go into any specific ones, but you guys probably know what they are, rely on a lot of front-end or client-side or website systems to do some pretty sophisticated interaction with the back end. And the reality is it's the back end developer who's going to be better able to implement those quote unquote front end systems. You might not be a graphic designer, you might not uh, have a background in color theory and negative space and all that other stuff that makes websites look pretty, but in order to implement these tools you do have to understand how some of these technologies play in the actual browser. Now, a Sharp developer, and a couple of them have already told me that 
Well, that stuff is all back end anyway. It just is running on the uh, on the web server. I mean, excuse me, on the uh, web browser. So I think it might be a little bit of a, a semantic uh, question, and we could debate it for hours. But from my point of view, um, front end versus back end really is is a question that's difficult to answer. And if you have a comfort level with front end, and your thing is CSS. Getting experience and an understanding of how the back end of your site works, especially with a, with a, with a tool like Drupal, uh, which, by the way, in my opinion, is a framework more than it is a CMS. Um, and I'll get into that as well in a minute. Having um, an ability to understand the quote-unquote back end, or at least uh, the CMS function of Drupal, for a front-end developer is extremely important with modern websites with modern frameworks. Um, it's not just HTML anymore, and your code in many cases is calling for functions or procedures or objects that live and operate in the back end. So when you start getting into things like um, Ajax and other jQuery um, uh, functions and calls and, and commands that you're going to do that might look a little bit like back-end stuff but, or back-end code, but it's really operating and working in the front end requires you to have a little bit of a discipline of, uh, uh, on both sides of this line that is becoming more and more blurred. And then uh, lastly, for your web experience, you will, you will want to be realistic about the development methodologies that you have worked in. So what development methodologies have I worked in? Scrum, Agile, Waterfall, Traditional, um, and can you define them? Do you know what they mean? Um, a lot of times you will interview with a company that will tell you they're an Agile company, and they don't know what Agile means. They think that means that they adapt to market change or something. They, they don't know how Agile applies to the development process. If you cannot define all of those development methodologies, you probably should spend a couple of uh, minutes that it would probably take you to read up on it. No shortage of articles on Wikipedia uh, and other places. I'm not advocating a particular development environment uh, or methodology for that matter, but different companies will. They will say, this is how we work. We, you know, we are a waterfall shop. We do defense contract programming and we're recoding these older systems and here's the 400 page manual and you'll spend the next three weeks reading and familiarizing yourself with it and then you'll start writing down your take on what the requirements are and in a few years we'll start coding. So that is a legitimate uh, position for someone who wants to work in that environment but you have to understand how that environment works and again is that a good fit for me? Um, you want to ask yourself, uh, what have I learned? So the question I ask is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I ask this often, am I the sum of my experiences or something more? So what gets created um, in my brain as a result of all these things that have happened to me or that I have made happen over the course of my professional and, and personal experience? And um, what are my needs and wants? So is there a difference? Some people would say yes. Some people would say no. It's all the same. Oh, I want this. Or, oh, I need to have this. I need this kind of computer. I need this kind of environment. And really, um, you have to be able to differentiate between what is a need and what is a want. You know, you need to eat. You may want to eat steak, but you don't need to eat steak, unless maybe you're really anemic and that's uh, the quickest way you're going to get some iron. Um, spinach is good too, but maybe you're allergic to spinach, so you need to eat steak. I don't know. But, but there is a difference between needs and wants, and it's important to be aware of those. Um, and what is my preferred work environment? And for some people, their work environment is a need. Some people are physically or uh, emotionally unable to work in certain work environments, whereas other people would thrive in those same work environments. 
um, and other people need that work environment in, in order to be able to get anything done. So do I want to work from home or from the office? Do I want to sit on the beach and work? Those are all valid questions. Um, do I want to work in a team or by myself? Am I a cowboy or a cowgirl? Do you know what that is? Is that a good thing? I would submit that sometimes, yes, it can be a good thing. So look up cowboy coder if you don't know what that is. Uh, do I follow coding standards? If you're using Drupal, you probably should. So if you're listening to this, that means you probably are using Drupal and therefore you probably should follow some coding standards. Um, chances are you are not going to be the only person who looks at your code. Whether it's after you finish your contract with your employer and move on somewhere else and in a couple of years someone else has to look at what you did, which hopefully has excellent commenting and is laid out properly and has your name all over it. That's your calling card for the future and that's going to get someone to call you back or email you and ask you for help or rehire you. So um, follow a standard that somebody else could walk in and take over tomorrow if you won the lottery and decided to quit. Um, it's just a good practice. Uh, Git, do you use it? SVN? What are Git and SVN? What is version control? If you're asking that question, you should probably read up on version control. Um, do you have a, a preference for an OS? Are you an, uh, uh, an OS X person? Are you, do you only want to work with a, uh, you know, uh, Ubuntu? Or are you a Windows guy or gal? Um, there is no right or wrong environment, but some employers will have a preference. Um, or will be constrained by the relationships they have with their parent companies to be locked into a particular software uh, environment for their OS, for all machines on site, and even all the way down to the IDE. You, you may go work for a shop that insists that everything must be coded in Dreamweaver. And you might like Komodo Edit or Ultra Edit, or maybe you like Notepad. <laughs> So it's important to, to, to know if you have a strong preference and if there are certain um, IDEs that you won't feel comfortable working in. And that's really, um, for some people, it uh, can be a deal breaker, deal breaker. So you should ask yourself that question. And uh, regarding Drupal with uh, web development uh, or web experience, I like to ask this question, how Drupal am I? You know, um, how comfortable am I with Drupal's admin interface? And if I'm at the level where I'm just getting started and I can install Drupal and I can configure a couple of modules and I can use the admin interface to create a website, um, that sort of, I think, counts for most people who can use a computer. So if that's you, what do you have to do to get to the, ne to the next level? Um, and that brings me to the next point, which is, what about key Drupal modules? Views, panels, or other modules that you may feel are key? And how well do you know them? And how well do you know their idiosyncrasies? And what other modules they will or will not work with? And... Uh, whether you're on an older or the latest version or a not yet released version, um, how do those uh, modules and how does that uh, interface work to your advantage as a tool and as an asset to help a company get the website that they need? And if you don't have a clear answer to that question, you have to find one because your interviewer won't be able to answer that for you. Um, and lastly, can I use Drush? And do I like to? This goes back to the command line comment I made earlier. If you use Drupal for anything more than building very, very basic websites, which is fine if that's all you use it for, there is definitely, definitely a need for that. But if that's what all you use Drupal for, there could be an argument that you may not need Drush. However, if you just have one template that you use and one installation that you do, 
and it's the most simple cookie cutter operation. And that's, you have your comfort zone or your lane and you just stay in that lane and that's your thing. Chances are learning a little bit about Drush, just familiarizing yourself with some of the basics will substantially reduce your development time. Which means if you are an independent consultant or an independent developer and your goal is to have your own shop that builds these little template-like cookie cutter sites, Drush is one of the tools that will help you get more clients and it will make your clients happy because you will be able to achieve changes and updates and upgrades and um, revision, uh, uh, revert, reverting back to earlier revisions of your software very, very quickly instead of going in and, and <laughs> using the Drupal admin to the admin uh, interface to manually reset, you know, 20 to 30 to 50 to 100 different parameters and trying to remember which ones you did and did you do them in the right order, you might be able to accomplish the same thing with one command on the command line. Uh, I know that sounds like a lot, but if you get uh, a little bit of experience with version control, uh, Drupal uses Git, um, if you get a little bit of experience with Drush, uh, even novice developers with not a lot of background in Drupal will be able to achieve what looks like very sophisticated, fast solutions to problems that otherwise would take hours and literally achieve the solutions in seconds. Um, and if you can do that, that will push you towards uh, getting a position that is, that is a good fit uh, for the company and it'll uh, keep you sane. So the last thing uh, in inventory that you want to do is you have to ask yourself this question, what do I need? What do I need? What do I want to get? I, I touched on this before. You have to evaluate and prioritize necessities versus wishes. So the statements that you would probably say are, I would like to have a Ferrari, if that's what you like. Or I would like to have a flying car. I don't know why I'm, on, I'm just stuck on cars today, but um, I would like to have, uh, you know, whatever it is. Um, versus I need to have. Uh, I need to have a quiet work environment. I need to have a supportive team. Uh, I need to have music when I work and when I don't work. So I, I just need to have music. That may be a deal breaker for someone. It's a need. If you want to know if it's a deal breaker or if it's a need, just ask yourself, if I had all other things being equal and one company took away or wasn't able to provide the need, is it a slam dunk? Absolutely, I would only consider with the other company. Or, or if they took away something, would I? No, there's no way I would go to this company because this other company has this one thing. That's a need. If all other things are equal and one company has one thing and one company doesn't, and you say, well, they don't have this, but eh, the other one's maybe a little closer, or you know, you sort of start finding yourself juggling and weighing the balances. That's probably a want. Um, and you can look into your personal life to determine what your needs are, but I would submit to you that they will overlap. So once you've done this preparation and asked these questions and realistically evaluated yourself and taken inventory of yourself, you are ready to go to an interview. Um, before you do this, you are not prepared to go to an interview, no matter how good of a developer you are. If you don't know yourself beyond, oh, these are the languages that I know, this is what my degree says, and this is how many years I've been doing this. If you don't do this realistic assessment, an honest assessment, um, you can't walk into an interview and just nail it. You just can't. Because you might think you did and then realize, oh wait, this isn't really a good fit for me. It looks like a great job, but oh, you know what, I'm just not happy here, and I don't know what's wrong. And that comes from not really um, uh, doing the background preparation and, and what I call taking inventory of yourself. So in the interview, there's a couple things you're gonna wanna do. The first one you're gonna wanna do is ask. When you go into an interview, a lot of times developers, designers, and prospective employees in general tend to get a little nervous because it's an interview. 
you know, it's public speaking and scary and they're looking at me and evaluating me. Well, guess what? That company has invested a lot more time, energy, and other resources to be there for you. And when you walk in nervous, they're nervous. They're saying, man, I just spent $5,000 on this ad. And I read 80 resumes and I called 35 of them. And I've got four people coming in and this is one of them. And I've only got four chances. And I need to hire a developer. That's you sitting in the chair. You're one of four people out of 80 resumes that a $100 ad or a thousand or literally a $5,000 investment yielded. So if they're going to do four interviews after spending five grand on conferences and flyers and promotion and advertisements, dinners, travel, they've spent $1,250 to get you into that chair. They're happy you're sitting in the chair. They're, they didn't bring you in there to beat you up. They, they, they just really, they probably didn't. They, they brought you in there because they're hoping you're going to be a good fit. Are you going to answer all of their prayers? So when you go into the interview, they're, you're expecting them to ask you a bunch of questions. They may or may not be expecting you to ask them some questions. But I know that when I interview somebody, I am hoping they will ask me questions because it lets me know they've thought about the position and that they have a brain. And that's why I'm hiring them, for their brain. If they're a developer, the only thing I care about is what's inside their head and how that translates to their ability to work with the team and develop solid code that contributes to the company's success. Really, that's all I care about. I don't care about their past experience that much. I want to know, are they smart? Can they work with the team? Can they work with me? Can they come up with an elegant solution? So the first thing you want to do is you want to ask the interviewer, what does the company need? What else is missing from their inventory? You know, they've got all these developers, they've got offices, they've got computers, they have in some cases, you know, millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. What, what's not on the shelf? And they'll tell you, they'll say, we need X, Y, Z. And, and then the next thing you want to ask them, and this might sound like a crazy question, but it's an, I think this is probably the best question <laughs> an interviewee could ask an interviewer. In an, in an interview, because it really opens the door to an honest dialogue. And the question is, if they could have it all their way, what kind of person would they hire? And I, and I would ask it just like that. Do you have any questions? Yes. Um, Mr. Interviewer, if you could have it all your way, what kind of person would you hire? Ms. Interviewer, if you could have it all your way, what kind of person would you hire? You should probably practice asking that question. It is, I would argue, one of the most, if not the most important questions you can ask an interviewer. Not what are my hours, not how many people are you hiring, not how long you've been in business. Those things are all important, but they, they don't even come close to, if you could have it all your way, what kind of person would you hire? An interview who can't, an interviewer who cannot answer that question is not able to let you know whether or not their company is going to be a good fit for you because they're not able to give you any kind of a framework on which to evaluate whether or not you think you will be a good fit for that company. And after they ask, answer that question, hopefully they answer it with an answer that, that sounds good to you, you, you would want to ask them, well, if you could hire that person, how would you want that person or how would you need that person to work? That comes after. You don't ask about the work hours and the environment and the hardware and all this other stuff before you find out the kind of person. If they could have it all their way, what's the kind of person they would hire? If they say, well, if we could have it all our way, the kind of person we would hire is we would want to bring in somebody who, you know, lives, eats, breathes, and drinks code. 
and they're going to come in at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning and work till 10 o'clock at night because they're just a get-it-done person and they're really committed. And we only pay for 40 hours a week, but if they put in their 80 hours a week, within three to five years, they're going to get promoted to junior developer position. If they could have it all their way and that's what they want, I'm, you know, I'm not a developer, but that doesn't really sound like a, a great deal to me. And I actually have 11 developers who uh, work with me on a day-to-day -day basis. And I've heard from more than one of them that their previous employers had that kind of mentality. We are going to grind these people and get every possible thing we can out of them. That's what we're, we're here to do. We are going to squeeze them. And you, you hear about developers burning out. It's not the company's fault. Yeah, the company hired them, but they picked the company. So if you could have it all your way, what kind of person would you hire? Oh, all right. You'd hire this kind of person that does this and that. Well, that sounds interesting. Well, how would you need that person to work? And that's just a little bit more specific. Now, uh, I'm going to say at this uh, point, and we're a little more than halfway through here, uh, thank you to Thierry, who is a new developer who started uh, with our company uh, last week. Uh, I met him at a meetup for PHP, and he sprung a test on me. He pulled out his iPhone. I said, do you have any questions? And he pulled out his iPhone, and he said, well, yeah, actually, I do have a couple. And uh, I said, okay, well, what are they? He said, do you mind if I read you them from my iPhone? It's uh, called the Joel test. Have you heard of it? And he said, no, because I hadn't. I said, but go ahead. I'll do my best. And he proceeded to ask me, I think, about 12 questions that Joel on software says you should ask every interviewer or every company. So he interviewed me. And I thought, wow, these are really great questions. I wish I would have thought of them. And I didn't. But I answered all of them. Uh, I missed one. One of the questions was, do you code, do you require prospective development candidates to code during the interview? And the answer is no. Now, since I'm not a developer, making someone code in the interview wouldn't serve any practical purpose. Because the reality is, whether or not they can code will become apparent on their first day. So if they tell me they can code, and if I have a good rapport with them, and they sound like they're a good fit, you know what? I've interviewed enough people, and it's probably a good chance that they're making a fairly accurate representation of their ability, especially if they've done, um, <laughs> if they've done the uh, inventory before they come to the interview. And I don't think that making people code in an interview is, a, is an accurate gauge of their ability. Some people don't work well under pressure. But the other 11, uh, I answered yes to. And I said, how did I do? And he said, well, you passed. You got 11 out of 12. And I said, well, thanks. I'm glad I passed. I said, could you send me a link to that? And he did. He right on the spot, which was nice. Um, so the Joel test. So thank you to Joel on software.com for uh, writing that uh, article. Now, after you ask these questions, the next thing you're going to want to do is share with the company, assuming they answer your questions uh, in a way that, that feels good and, and, and sounds good to you. And you want to tell them what you will give to the company if they hire you and what you need from the company if you accept the position. So that goes back to the inventory. There is absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, I think it's a benefit for anybody being interviewed to come prepared. So if you've done your homework and you've taken your time to do this uh, inventory of your skills, of what kind of person you are, of what kind of job that you want, write it out. Create an outline. And as the person's interviewing you, check everything off and let them know, well, I've prepared an outline of some questions and stuff that I have. Would you mind if I check these things off as we go through the interview? Because as interviews go, you know, I want to pay attention to everything you're saying, and it's going to be hard for me to remember uh, all of my questions. So would that be okay with you? And I can't imagine an interview saying, no, you can't, you know, follow, you can't use your own outline. Most interviews follow an outline. Uh, most interviewers follow an outline. So 
when you tell them uh, what you're going to give them if they hire you and what you need from them if you accept the position, you need to find out exactly how the company feels about that. And the way that you do that, this is really cool. I'm going to give you guys a little tidbit. The way you find out exactly, exactly how the company, the interviewer representing the company feels about what you are able to provide and what you expect from the company is you do this. You say, how do you feel about that? You just ask them. You're going to be sitting with an interviewer for anywhere from an hour to four hours if you're interviewing for a high-level position. They're going to ask you a ton of questions. It's okay for you to ask them questions too. And I'm going to do this if you hire me. And if you hire me, what I need is I need this and I need this and I need this. How do you feel about that? And maybe those aren't the exact words that you use, but you do have to find out how they feel about what you bring to the table, what you're offering, and what your needs are. If they feel good about what you bring to the table and they feel good about what you need, that's the time to move on and ask the company what they bring to the table. I'm going to go back one slide. If they don't feel good about what you bring to the company, if they don't say, that sounds excellent, or, you know what, that sounds really promising, I think you have potential, or, wow, you know, I'd really like to bring you in for another interview based on the stuff that, that you've shared with me, or, you know what, we would be able to provide those things that you want. We have all of that. If they don't say that or indicate in the affirmative to what you're going to bring and what you expect, from my point of view, the interview is almost over. Now, out of courtesy to the interviewer, I will spend the rest of the time in the, in, in the interview with them if, if I was uh, seeking a position and they, they, they took the time to, to let me come in. But if they didn't feel good about what I bring to the table or what I expected in return for my time and my commitment, dedication to the company and my sharing of my knowledge and my years of skill and, and, and development experience and design experience, I wouldn't move on to ask them about what they offer. Because what the company offers is really not material to the equation of your dream job or of even a best fit job if the company doesn't appreciate you and isn't able to give you what you need. And too many times, Developers answer an ad that has some nice salary package, nice work environment, a prestigious sounding name of a company, and they jump in and, oh, I got a job with such and such, or, oh, I got a job with so and so. And then they burn out in six months or two years, and then they want to make a career change. And most developers get into software development not by accident. We're so lucky. We get, we get to do a job that most of us love doing. So why anybody would want to put themselves in a position where they're going to get burned out from the thing they love to do is just beyond me. So if they do feel like a match, if they do value what you bring to the table, if they are able to give you what you need, that's when you want to ask the company about things like their track record, their stability. You know, what, how long have you been in business? What is the work environment like? physical environment, what's the office space look like, what's the culture, what's the lighting, what are the working hours. These are all secondary things. If they're able to give you all the things that you need, then those questions have probably already been answered if you told them that those were needs. If you didn't list them as needs, these extra things that we're talking about now are just maybe pluses or maybe eh, minor inconveniences that if you could have it all your way, that you would have them be a certain way, but they might not be in any way, shape, or form requirements for you as a developer. And it's, it's really key that you understand the difference between wants and needs. And the way to do that is to get all the needs out of the way first. Because if at the end of the, uh, the question of how do you feel about that, they say, we are not able to give you what you need, and you're not quite offering what we need, you really don't have to concern yourself too much about their perks or with their compensation package. A job that pays a lot of money but doesn't satisfy your needs is not a good job. 
it will not advance you in your career. We pay a very competitive salary. I would not feel good about somebody coming to work for our company just because of the salary. That does not promote mutually rewarding, positive, long-term relationships. And that's really what getting a good job or a dream job is all about. It has to be mutually rewarding. You have to get what you need, and you have to be able to give the company what the company needs. It has to be a positive experience. So it's mutually rewarding and it's positive. If it's those two things, guess what? It'll probably also end up being long-term equals dream job. There's probably like a calculus equation in there to figure out what the exact percentages of how much you need to give and how much they need to give. But the easy test is, do they give me what I need? I have my inventory list that I've completed. I've checked off the six things that are my main needs in the first 10 minutes of the interview. This is sounding awesome. Now they have three main needs and those things are a breeze for me. I can definitely do those. Well, guess what? The rest of the interview should be a cakewalk. And you're interviewing with the company because you've applied for a company that based on the description looked like it was going to be a best fit for you in the first place. That's what this whole session is about. It's finding a best fit for the developer. So after you find out the answers to all those questions, you really have to ask yourself a question. The most important question of the interview. You take all this information and the ability to edit this all down to one simple question, five words, are we a good fit? It's just like shoes. The interview at a company, whether it's one of the biggest companies in the world or whether it's an individual client, is just like going to the store to buy a pair of shoes. If it's the right color or right style, that's important. If it's the right label, eh, that might be important too. Does it suit the job that you're going to be wearing the shoe for? If you're going out in the rain, you want a pair of boots, or you're going to some function where you need some dressy shoes. Do the shoes fit? Everything else could be perfect. If the shoe doesn't fit, it's not going to be a good experience. Just think Cinderella. If you don't focus on the fit, if you don't focus on your needs, you're going to be doing what the, what the evil stepsisters did. You're going to be cutting off toes and contorting yourself into all weird positions to try and make, make yourself fit into these shoes that are not for you. <clears throat> and the same thing applies in a job interview. Um, the same thing applies when you're, when you're looking for a company. If you are a good fit or not is determined based upon how well the company matches your inventory and you match the company's need to fill the things that are missing from their inventory. So to wrap up, I'd like to share with you guys a couple of mistakes. This is the stuff you shouldn't do. Um, 400 resumes. Um, we're all web professionals here. Um, it's amazing to me how many people list friends as professional references. Now, if you're right out of college and the only place you've worked is your parents' firm, obviously you have to list that. But you don't have to list your parents as the only reference on there if there are other people who worked for the company. You can say, I worked for my parents' company, and this person was in charge of HR. They're not my sister-in-law. They're, they're an HR person. This is the person I worked with at my company. They were another intern. Um, don't rush when filling out an application. Companies spend, and this will give you guys a little idea of the company's point of view. Companies spend thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars, just writing an application. The reason they do that is because those are the questions that they either need or want to have answered to evaluate very quickly whether or not you might be a good fit. 
it's not the be-all, end-all, but it gives them some general direction as to where you're coming from. And believe it or not, the way you fill out the application often says more uh, to the company about your ability to work with the company than what's in the application. Is it messy? Did you fill it out with blue ink like they asked you to? That's not a test. It's not, oh, please fill it out with blue ink. Let's see if they do it. They ask you to fill it out in blue ink because it's easier to read. It stands out from the black ink that's printed on the application. Um, and if they've spent thousands of dollars preparing this application, and you believe that they really are interested in you and they brought you in for the interview because they think that there might be a chance that you could come join their team, don't you really think they would want you to take the time to properly fill out the application? Now we send the applications to the interviewee before the interview and we ask them to send it back to us so we can review it before we meet with them. Sometimes they do, sometimes they walk in with it. Sometimes they walk in empty-handed and say, oh, I had a problem, you know, filling it out and my Apple sort of destroyed the font and it didn't work and I'm thinking, and you're a web developer and you can't fill out an application? It opens on Google Docs, it opens on Word in my MacBook, it opens in Word in my eight-year-old Sony Vio. Uh, I'm not a developer and I could open that little attachment. Why can't you open an attachment and fill out an application? I spent all this time preparing it just for you. So those are the kind of mistakes you, you really don't want to make with the application. And then lastly, um, I was wearing a short sleeve t-shirt yesterday. I'm wearing a button down collared shirt today. And the reason I did that is because I value, appreciate and respect all of you for taking the time to come and listen to me talk about the interview process and how to become better at getting the position, your dream job, uh, with Drupal uh, or with whatever software development program you end up choosing to, to work with or, or other job. I think this actually applies to not just web developers. But if I'm not conducting interviews, I usually won't wear a button-down collared long sleeve plain shirt. I'll wear jeans, and sometimes I'll wear a sh uh, collared shirt, and sometimes I won't. I'll wear tennis shoes, and I'll just be comfortable. And as a developer, you are not expected to wear a collared shirt. You're expected to wear jeans and a t-shirt and, you know, some tennis shoes, and, you know, maybe you have piercings and a mohawk and tattoos all down your arms, all the way to your wrists and onto your fingers. And you know what? If you're an amazing coder, well, guess what? You get to dress and have any kind of style you want. But when you come into an interview at a corporation, not everyone at the company is going to be dressed that way. And it's just something you want to keep in mind. And you can tell the interviewer, you know, I wore a, a shirt today and slacks because I wanted to just show you that I appreciate you taking the time to interview me. But normally when I'm coding, I prefer to wear jeans and a ring t-shirt and, and my old ratty tennis shoes. Is that okay? Nine times out of ten, they'll say, yeah, you can wear whatever you want. Thanks for dressing up. So I'm not suggesting that you go out and rent a tux or anything crazy. Um, but really, don't dress for the job. Dress for the interview. And I've got a couple quick things for you to remember. Um, again, you are all either web developers or designers. Use an online search tool of your choice and search for the following phrase, common resume mistakes. you will probably see your resume. It's free. It's a very quick tool. There are no, there's no shortage of people out there who have provided way better suggestions for how to complete a resume than I might be able to give you today. Um, you don't have to take all of their advice, but use your common sense and take from the suggestions of other people who do this for a living and get paid to create resumes for people that get them the position they're looking for when the resume is the determinant. 
um, and apply those things that they've learned to your resume. After all, isn't that what Drupal's about? There's a module for that? Well, there's a couple of very powerful search tools online that you can use to fix your, uh, to fix your resume. So take advantage of those. Um, I'm going to tell you one thing that is the most valuable thing you will put on your resume, which are 7 to 12 keywords at the top of your resume. I first learned about this when uh, I was in night school at CSUN about 18 years ago, 15, 16, yeah, 16 years ago. And um, I had an instructor who insisted that we have to put these keywords at the top of the resume. And I thought, this is retarded. It's already in the description. It, you know, my skills are listed down here. And if you're applying for a computer position, a developer position, usually your skill set, which includes all things computer, are at the bottom of the resume. I, I would think most interviewers who are hiring developers would rather see that on the very top, very first uh, <clears throat> part of the resume when they look at it. So if you're a Drupal 7 ninja, then um, those three keywords should probably be, or two keywords and a number should probably be the first keywords at the very top of your resume, above your name even, right across the top. Drupal 7 ninja. CSS expert, systems engineer, IT guru, entry level designer, whatever those words are, and it doesn't always have to be three sets of words. It could just say CSS3. It could say JavaScript. But those key words that you would put in a normal forum post or those three things that you would want to leave the interviewer with the impression of as that relates to your skill, your ability, your talent, your experience. Senior web developer, 10 years experience, results, fun, soccer player. <laughs> whatever, whatever. If you want to catch someone's attention, that's fine too. Ask your friends, colleagues, or family to check your resume. They will know if you're being realistic, and they will provide you with honest feedback. And if you can't show them, you probably shouldn't show an employer your resume. If you don't feel comfortable sharing your resume with your family, there's probably something in there that isn't quite right. If you don't feel comfortable sharing it with your friends, there's probably something in there that isn't quite right. If you don't want to share it with your colleagues that work with you at your job, that's fine, but there are no shortage of peers that will help you and review your resume, and then you can exchange the, the favor. Review the resumes of your peers at um, meetups like this and, and conferences and camps. And then lastly, I mentioned this earlier, properly complete employment applications and other documents, very, very key. That is what you are going to leave with the employer when you leave. So they won't remember every question they asked you. But if the application is filled out and if the resume is filled out properly, they will be able to very quickly recall everything that happened in that interview. They will remember you. And it's not always just having a, a good interview. It's having an interview that the interviewer uh, is able to recall after you've left. Sometimes that interviewer may interview eight people in one day. How are you going to stand out? Well, the only way you're going to stand out, in my opinion, to an interviewer who interviewed eight people for an hour each and took a 15-minute lunch break in between is that when they look at those resumes, they're impeccable. When they look at those applications, they're properly filled out, um, and they answer all the questions, no blank spaces, seems redundant, Put N slash A everywhere where something is not applicable. Why? It lets them know you looked at it and you have attention to detail. So in summary, I want to provide a couple of additional resources for you guys. Uh, Groups.drupal.org, excellent resource. Drupal.org uh, slash coding standards. Uh, LADrupal.org. Uh, PHP.net 
and all of its local versions. Uh, LAPHP.net, uh, LAPHP.org, I think, is, is another one. They're all listed on PHP.net. Uh, Meetup.com is an excellent place to find and connect with people who are going through the same kind of trials and tribulations and struggles and who are winning the same victories that you guys are going to be earning as you go through this process of finding your dream job and they will share their experiences with you. Uh, Craigslist, believe it or not, over 70% of the employees hired by our company in the last year came from Craigslist. And I think the number is actually a little closer to 80%. We put a new ad in Craigslist every week. It's not just for finding babysitters for your cat. It's a good recruiting tool. It's bare bones. It looks like code. It's easy to read. You can scan it quickly. It's effective. It takes a little time to do it. But if you look on Craigslist, you will find developers' positions available. You will find designers' positions available. And you will see the companies that are consistently on Craigslist. And the ones that are doing a good job, will, their ads will change from week to week, from month to month. We have openings for eight developers. We have openings for six developers. We have openings for four developers. Watch those ads. Watch the numbers go down. Some companies are smart. They change the numbers and drop them on purpose every week because they figure they'll, they'll get your attention. Um, but you can kind of tell from, from reading these ads. Um, go to co-working spaces like uh, Coloft and Drop Labs uh, in LA. There's, there's other spaces in your, in your area where people get together. Um, co-working spaces are a great place to meet and network with other small business owners who have either not reached a level where their business is large enough to support offices yet or where they don't need offices. So why waste a ton of capital on offices where they can use that for hardware and advertising and other things? So it really is sort of a, an extension of the almost like the open source community and people are always willing to help and share and, and network. And lastly, use tools like uh, Wikipedia. And if you look the second one from the bottom, it says uh, Drupal.org coding standards again. I can't stress enough, even as a non-developer, if you follow good coding standards, team leaders, stakeholders, VPs of companies will be able to look at the snippets of code that your supervisors or scrum coaches or department heads are actually taking from your screenshots and forwarding to show what a great job you're doing if in fact you're doing a great job. It's not that much more time um, intensive to write well-documented excellent code than to just quickly write sloppy code. It really isn't. In fact, I would argue that it takes less time to write good code than to write down and dirty code. It actually is more efficient because if you properly document it, someone else or you in six months can go back to what you did and you'll know exactly what you were thinking when you coded it. So follow those coding standards and you can use modules and tools like Coder and other resources to help you make sure your code is, is compliant. And last two things I wanted to leave you guys with before I open up for any last questions. Hopefully I've answered most of them. Uh, a couple of people helped me uh, with this presentation, both by offering suggestions for topics and by providing me with um, the time uh, to prepare. And they are uh, some members of our team, including uh, Erica, Stuart, Mike, Kaori, uh, Walter, and Thierry. Uh, um, and they can all be found on the Drupal Camp LA website, and a lot of them also have usernames. Uh, most of them, I think, have usernames on uh, GDO, uh, groups.drupal.org. Uh, that was my presentation on how to land your dream job with Drupal, guaranteed. And I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to listen and for sharing your time with me. It's appreciated. And I wanted to let you know that you, too, I guarantee you, if you follow up some or most of the steps that I've outlined, I guarantee you can land your dream job with Drupal. So thank you, and I'll open it up for any questions. I was reading the wiki on cowboy coding, but you want to just kind of skip over that? 
Yeah, cow, cowboy coding. So, um, cowboy coding. A lot of the well, you can actually read about this on Wikipedia. Uh, cowboy coding. So, it's sort of uh, slightly pejorative or negative in in its nature, but. Uh, cowboy coding is uh, sort of a coding style that is someone who maybe doesn't necessarily conform to what other developers or interested parties might consider to be a set of rigid requirements. And in some instances, being a cowboy is actually a good thing. Someone who's able to be out there on their own find a solution, maybe in some cases people who aren't that interested in getting bogged down in coding requirements but just need to get a website up and get a result immediately to, to fix a problem or to achieve a temporary solution. Sometimes that grab a bunch of stuff and slap it together really quickly uh, kind of an attitude is exactly what's needed. Um, Cowboy coding does not typically work well in environments where a developer or designer or web designer or web developer has to work with others on the actual system or code or software or website because cowboys tend to like to do things their own way and they have their methods that work for them and they, by their nature, don't have to conform to um, what somebody else's requirements might be, which is why you'll find a lot of independent uh, developers out there who are actually embracing the term cowboy because they've found a coding style or standard or a lack of a standard that is a good fit for them. And if they're able to quickly produce results and if they're coding at a level where even though their standard doesn't match someone else's standard or the bulk of the development community standard of what code should look like, if their clients are happy and they're producing elegant and well-executed results, um, I think they would argue that, that being a cowboy is not such a bad thing. But it's important to know if that's your style or not, because if it is, there are certain environments, both um, from the standpoint of the types of clients that you'll have and the types of people you will or, or won't be able to work with as effectively that will come in, uh, that will be more or less affected to the degree that you are a more of a renegade or a cowboy or out there on the range doing your own thing and just getting it all done. So I don't think it's a bad thing to be, to be a cowboy, um, but I do think that it means that if you are, um, you may be a better fit in certain types of positions than in others. Anybody else have a question? Or does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, does anybody else have a question? So just elaborate maybe what types of positions would cowboy code be better in? Well, I don't, I, I don't feel qualified to say what types of positions a cowboy coder would be better in, but what I can say is that it's been my experience working with developers um, on a continual basis for for some time now that people who run their own shops where they are the designer, developer, accountant, secretary, IT person, uh, one person shops, development shops, um, sometimes with uh, a seemingly impossible client list, tend to sort of be cowboys. Um, it's almost a requirement. They don't, people who run those kind of shops don't have the time to document anything. They're always coding. They're always developing. And I'm not in any way uh, critical of that approach for the developers that, that find solace in the chaos that is, I have 20 sites that I have to finish by the end of the month. You know, fortunately, they have tools like Drupal and WordPress and Joomla and Zend and Cake and Codeigniter that allow them to grab objects and snippets of code. And, and I mean, there's Google. You can just, you know, whatever SQL statement you need, uh, you just type in what it is that you're looking for, followed by uh, MySQL, and chances are you will get some well thought out solutions that you can very quickly 
hack together. And I don't think hacking is a bad thing. Um, but you sort of have to have a cowboy mentality to, to work like that. On the other hand, if you're working as part of a team who relies on version control and standards and tools, as I mentioned, Coder, for example, to check and validate that your code is laid out properly so that future generations of developers after the, develop, the original developer who wrote it has moved on either to another part of the project or possibly been uh, uh, advanced to a different part of the company or maybe has left the company, larger enterprises, enterprises tend to need people who are, uh, let's say, less cowboy in their coding style or less cowgirl in their coding style. But I, I definitely think it, it has its place, and, and um, I'm not really a fan of pejorative terms in general, so I wouldn't like to you know, call people names. But I do think that it, it has been at least my experience that um, cowboys are able to um, be of a tremendous benefit in, in the right environment when they're sort of when they're, when they're in an environment that, that calls for a cowboy. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Yes. Yes, okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of Drupal Camp LA. And thank you to Drupal Camp LA for uh, having me out here.